Hey, you all out there. Thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday. It is greatly appreciated that you are giving us your time. Happy to see you all. Okay, it is two o'clock. Let us get started on the session on creating diverse and inclusive chapters. Buenas tardes, I'm Karina Ramirez. I am, um, I usually will start a different way to uh, presentation. So I figured I'd tell you a bit about me. So I'm originally from Ecuador. I am a parent to a wonderful college student that you see there on your left. Uh, I am a fan of sunrises. I love to dance prior to COVID. <laughs> I haven't been able to do that lately. And for those that know me, uh, I am a postcard collector. So uh, from time to time, I'll just ask people to send me postcards. And that picture at the bottom on the right hand side is uh, a picture that I share a lot because prior to doing this work, I was a journalist. And that was my time that I was sitting down um, writing notes on the floor in Philadelphia. Um, I was covering the post visit to the United States and I had no place to write. But I did that on the floor and I, it's a constant reminder of, you know, when you have to do things, you just adapt. So um, with CCL, I am presently the Diversity and Inclusion Director. My title officially changed last November, uh, but I have been around CCL since 2017, started as a volunteer, worked on the Latino section team on the PGM caucus. And then from there, the diversity titles began so now I get to do all of this work on a national level and I'm so excited to be able to do that. I presently live in West Palm Beach, Florida and I offer respect and gratitude to its original inhabitants, the Seminole, Tequesta, Diaga and Taino people who have stewarded this land for generations. My pronouns are she, her, ella, Patricia. Eteapale, soy Patricia. And eteapale is actually the word greetings in the original people of the place where I reside, which are the Eshtognak people, which I am also affiliated with the tribe. Their colonized Spanish name is right there in that picture. You can see Carizo Come Cruz, the tribe of Texas. And um, it's one of the things that I find great joy in helping indigenous folks with uh, protecting the ancestral lands, ancestral burial grounds, protecting the earth. And um, to the left, you'll see a picture of me, very happy because I'm doing what I love to do, which is I love to go birding. Uh, it was a birdathon, So they gave us a certain area of, uh, of uh, the city of Edinburgh. And we ran around for a month finding as many species as we could. And it was just a great time. You see that little pupster right there? He's actually 12. That's Frankie. He's my dog. I love him very much. He brings me great joy. We've been on many adventures together. He had just come back from a vet and he had a good, a good visit. He got an A+. Plus. And then to the right of that, you'll see um, several identification guides for birds and plants and butterflies and uh, being a naturalist is something that I had before I joined CCL. And I was an environmental educator working with little ones at various nature centers and uh, world birding centers, the butterfly center. And so that's, those are some of my treasured holy books, I call them. And over there to the right, you'll see me and there's a bunch of hills and mountains. That was in Tlaxlaca, Mexico. And it was an agroecology trip. And we learned all about sustainable farming and rainforests and the mountains and it was beautiful. And I'm from the lower Rio Grande Valle here along the Tex-Mex border. Very proud of it, love it. My pronouns are she, her, ella. I have now been with CCL. This paper will be one whole month. So I'm very excited to be here as a diversity inclusion program coordinator and I am looking forward to the rest of this presentation and the rest of what we can do with CCL, bringing diversity to chapters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. Okay, well, during the seminar today, 
we're going to go over um, a bit of the diversity and inclusion work that I am up to, uh, CCO National. We're going to talk a bit about creating an inclusive culture inside uh, your chapter. And we're going to do an activity to help us look from within. I wanted um, to just, it is my pleasure to be able to present to you our diversity fellows. You're going to see them here in the room. Um, they are helping us today with tech support. Um, Callum Sintron, Maria Dossier, and Sara Lee Gonzalez are the first TCO Diversity Fellows. So I am so incredibly excited that they are here volunteering their time supporting us during this program today. Thank you so much. Okay, so some community agreements before we start our wonderful conversation. Um, Oh, and before I forget, I will be unable, Patricia and I will be unable to look at questions in the chat while the presentation is going on. So please um, ask the question to the people that have labeled themselves, ask me text. And we will um, answer them um, when we get to the answer and question period. So our community agreements. We will listen to learn and understand. Our conversations will be respectful always. You're going to show your true self because we believe that honesty is the best policy. We won't always agree and that is okay. We won't always have the answer to all the questions. A reminder that we are learning together and we agree to have an open mind. So if you would please type either yes or agree in the chat and Sara Lee or Maria, if you can tell me that people are saying yes or agree in the chat, I would appreciate it. Yeah, it looks like everybody's agreeing, which is great. So everybody's I'm, gonna, I'm getting yeah. some direct messages about it too, so yep. Okay, wonderful, I appreciate it, thank you. Okay, so let me share a bit about CCL diversity so far. So as I mentioned, I've been in this role for about a year. It's been a year officially as a title. I was diversity outreach um, manager last year and my title changed so that I can, I think, uh, be more holistic in the type of work that I'm tracking. So here's some information of things that I'm tracking. A demographic by age. Um, this information was provided to us by our data and strategy director, Tony Serna. So it's good that we have this information and can be able to tell that we are doing so well in recruiting people under the age of 40. Um, this is fantastic. If you see the work of um, Clara Fang, uh, she has been engaging with all different types of people under the age of 40 from high school to college. And it is so good to see that reflected in our demographic. My diversity work also includes political affiliation. Um, as an organization, um, we are presently, the majority of us are 87% Democrats, 7.6 are independent, and 4.6 are Republicans. Um, we are still recruiting uh, people that want to help us do this work. Um, it is good to note that 9% of uh, Republicans are alarmed and 90% of them are also concerned. So we know that we have a better opportunity to be able to engage with our Republican friends, um, especially this year on the kind of work that we want to do. And of course our demographic by race. Um, we are getting better than when we started. Um, the organization started tracking um, ethnicity in 2013. At that point, we were 94% white and 6% people of color. We are now at 71% white and 25% people of color. Um, this is a work in progress. Patricia and I are here to help as much as we can to help diversify our chapters. And that is you know, a portion of our goal. Well, we work on all types of diversity, but the first three that I just mentioned uh, are the ones that uh, CCO National wrote in the diversity plan in 2016. But that doesn't mean 
that we don't think about all different forms of diversity, like LGBTQ. Um, we are talking about different type of things that we want to do um, in programming. So here are some activities that I am up to with your fellow CCLers. So Don Adu, uh, he actually coordinates um, diversity calls with the regional coordinators. And those have been taking place at CCL for a while. Um, we also have diversity teams. We are now up to six diversity teams. Um, the other work that we're doing, I have been working on Spanish language efforts since I joined in 2017. So we have a website dedicated to giving information in Spanish about what we're up to. Um, since I started work as a diversity coordinator prior to being director, um, I'm tracking diversity throughout our events. So being in a regional conference like today is one of them and doing trainings at a national level as well. Last year, we created a diversity and inclusion staff committee. So we have 10 members um, that have volunteered to look at our diversity plan and to make sure that we are implementing everything that we say and to also uh, help us you know, be accountable for this work. Things that I am seeing started last year that I'm very happy to be able to just support the cross collaboration among action teams. Um, the Catholic team and the Latino team got together last year, um, as well as the Latinos and conservatives, and they're all uh, doing different um, efforts um, that we hope we can invite more people to join those subgroups uh, this year. Last year, I created a new position called the community reps which are volunteers that are focused on chapter regional diversity support. Um, my goal is to have 11. So far, I have five to six um, community reps, but it is a, a wonderful team that now, a, along with them, the diversity fellows are also part of that team, as well as a diversity intern for this year. And all they're doing is tracking work on a local level to be able to ensure that we can support um, what chapter are doing. And of course, the diversity fellowship, those are three positions that started this year. And I am so glad to be able to see this and support this in the role that I personally hold. So as we think of this conversation, I was thinking of what are some things that I will want you to know? So I did this, I usually do this when I uh, put together presentations that have to deal with diversity. Um, and I'll be like, okay, well, let's look at the regional diversity. So I went and I pulled some maps from the US Census Bureau. Um, in this particular instance of diversity, we wanna think about representation. So I'm only gonna focus on race. This is the diversity among people in DC. These slides are gonna go rather fast and you will have access to them so you can see them. The reason why I'm pointing to these slides right now is because I want you to think of your chapter makeup. So if your chapter right now doesn't have communities represented in these slides as you will see them, I want you to think of what will be some activities that you could do in order to invite members of these communities to come and learn about CCL. So this is the makeup in DC which also has, is predominantly white, but as well as a big population of black and African-Americans. This is the Latino population in DC. And the reason why these slides are separate is because when they were presented in a particular place in the Census Bureau, they had two maps. So I just went over and copied the maps. Um, they usually separate Hispanic or Latino from all the other demographics and don't ask me why, it's so weird. Um, this is Maryland. Again, Maryland has predominantly white population, a large population of black and African-Americans. And look at the numbers of people that have two or more races or other races. 10.6% of the citizens in Maryland are Latino. Again, think of your chapter and think of the diversity that it could be possible to have. Delaware is 
0.7% white, but you do have an African American population as well as an American Indian. You even have an Asian community members there. Think about the members you don't have in your chapters. Delaware is also 9.6% Latino. New Jersey, again, predominantly white, but you do have, again, members of the African American community, members of American Indian and Alaska community, Asian community, people that have, um, in answer in their survey, they said that they, they were some other race alone and people that had two or more races. The Latino population in New Jersey, 20.9% Latino. Again, think of the makeup or your chapters and think of what is it that you can do to be able to have at least try to work toward um, increasing the diversity of your chapter to reflect somewhat of these numbers. It's a challenge. It's not something that can be done every day. It's not something that can be done right away, but there's nothing like today to get started. So I am focusing on those numbers because I go back and I usually think about our, our vision and our mission. We want to create a livable world. And in the way that I view diversity, or Patricia and I view diversity, we want everyone to be part of the solution. Or we want to invite as many people as we can get to this party, right? Because we think that as many people as we can bring to CCL will help us do the advocacy that we need to do to hopefully help us get this bill get passed. We need more voices. We need more people to be able to help us pass the word around about what we want to do. Patricia. Right, you're always on mute who, whenever it's time. Thank you for your patience. Um, so this is the time in the presentations where we like to give you a little bit of inspiration and a little bit of uh, meditation time. We provide a quote and this one I picked because I felt strongly about it. it. says, what we say and what we do ultimately comes back to us. So let us own our responsibility, place it in our hands and carry it with dignity and strength. And that is by Gloria Anzaldúa, American scholar and Chicana culture theory uh, theorist. She also uh, is a very famous, uh, she is a famous author of poetry, of stories. That picture you see, it says Borderlands La Frontera is what she's most known for. And she is actually, she was born here in the town that I'm calling you all from, Harlingen, Texas. And so she has uh, devoted, she devoted her time to, to talk about what it feels like to be a part of one world, but having to be on both sides. So it talks, she talks a lot about cultural issues, cultural barriers, but she always finds inspiration in it. And we wanted to share that with you. Thanks so much, Patricia. Okay, so while we're doing this diversity work, I often get uh, calls about doing anti-racism work. And as I'm coming to evaluate the work that I've been doing um, and also learning more because I um, was not a practitioner of diversity work, prior to joining CCL, um, came to determine that diversity and anti-racism are two different things. Uh, we have the number of people that came to this work today have expressed interest in this session. Um, you want to diversify your chapter. And at some point, you know, you want to be able to talk about anti-racism and how that plays. And sometimes people are like, well, what does that have to do with climate work? It has a lot to do with climate work, but we are talking about the representation of people and they are situations and things that happen that sometimes prevent different people from being part of our organization. So this is why I wanted to be able to uh, help you understand that the diversity work that I do 
is not particularly anti-racism. So from time to time, you will see an anti-racism training. And there are some chapters that have individually taken that on. But my work in itself deals with people. Diversity includes all the way in which people differ and it encompasses all the different characteristics that make one individual or group different from another. It is all inclusive and recognizes everyone and every group as part of the diversity that should be valued. It also involves different ideas, perspectives, as well as values. Anti-racism on the other hand, is defined as the work of actively opposing racism by advocating for changes in political, economic, and social life. Anti-racism tends to be an individual approach and set up in opposition to individual racist behaviors and impacts. I, um, there is a great resource called Racial Equity Tools. It has a lot of information uh, as well as terminology that has to deal with both diversity and anti-racism. And I highly suggest that you go and visit uh, their website. So here we have the uh, area where we talk about different barriers to um, diversity at CCL. So there are going to be times when folks say, we want diversity, but we don't know how to do it because this came up or this came up. And some of those things are language. Maybe they don't speak the same language or they don't have a strong uh, vocabulary as whatever the dominant language is. However, that shouldn't stop us. We just have to inquire on how to be inclusive. And that is why we have people that interpret and translate. And so if that's an issue, just contact CCL and we can work it out. We'll figure out a way, reach out to other chapters, ask them what they're doing if they're having an issue with uh, someone with multiple language, socioeconomic factors prior and after to COVID, especially after COVID, things have changed quite a bit. Ableism. And there are different issues for those with uh, ableism because some are seen and some are not. And that shouldn't stop us from being inclusive. It just means that they're going to need an accommodation and that's fine. We shouldn't be scared of that. We should be welcoming. Access to information. Not everybody has the internet. So maybe we need to focus on printouts and that's fine. Perspectives, gender, religion, political affiliations. So all those together have been some that have been brought up to us and that's something that we can all work on together. And the purpose of talking about the different barriers is to be able to note that there are people in our communities that sometimes for one reason or another just cannot participate in our events. That does not mean that they don't care about climate and that they don't care about solution to the planet, but there are just certain situations and different experiences from people that we need to be able to find a way to accommodate so that we can become more inclusive. On things that you may want to avoid. Um, I've heard this from, um, let me go back a bit. So in the three years that I had been part of CCO, uh, prior to me being in this diversity position, I began um, just listening to the people that I would come across and I was excited to be able to see more people of color at our conferences. So from time to time, I would hear things that would happen to them. And I would try to find a way to address that, whether, you know, going to the pub and talking to Madeline or talking to someone else in their regional chapter. Um, but these are the things that people have said to me <laughs> about some reasons about why they decide not to volunteer with CCL. For different reasons. And I actually know this because I asked. So um, this, this is not something that I'm making up. Uh, things that people have said, I was in a room and someone spoke over me. They didn't let me speak. They didn't listen to me. Um, assumptions about a person. People look at the way someone dressed and assume something that is completely wrong about the person. 
lacking empathy, talking um, people that talk more and listen less, um, people that for one reason or another just ignored the privilege. Um, COVID has been able to help us facilitate trainings and opportunities where some people just probably for one reason or another just cannot travel. So if we were doing this conference in person, there could be possibly people that for one reason or another just will be unable to travel wherever we're hosting this. Um, it's, it's something that sometimes people, you know, people think I'm like, oh, well, you know, we don't see people of color because people don't care. And I'm like, there's different situations happening to a lot of people of color, in, indigenous and black, that sometimes people just seem to ignore. And the lack of using gender specific words. Uh, that is something that I am learning myself. Um, giving the pronouns and asking people how they wish to self-identify is a respectful thing to do. So let's talk a bit about creating an inclusive culture because uh, it's the reason why you're here in this presentation. Patricia. Thank you. Cultural competency. So here we're talking about not making assumptions as a way to be respectful while communicating. Now we're talking about gender neutral pronouns. Now that could be something like saying folks, team, friends, I'm from Texas, I say y'all often. Some people use fam as a way to say short for family, everyone. If folks don't want to say what their pronouns are because they're just not comfortable yet, you don't have to worry about it. There are ways to just be able to be gender neutral while addressing a group. Now, the thing is there are folks that will say, these are my pronouns and we need to be respectful when in these groups. And that's why pronouns help us to facilitate effective communication, especially when it is something that's very, very important and close to those people's hearts because we wanna be inclusive. So we wanna be respectful. And they're also a part of people's culture or maybe how whatever it was linguistically they, they've come to communicate with, ethnic identities. It brings diversity and inclusion to our chapters. One thing I talk, um, I've talked about is there might be an individual that got their doctorate and maybe instead of saying, Mr. or Mrs., they might want to say, no, doctor, and they'll say their name. And we don't question that. We respect that because they've said, no, address me as doctor so-and-so. So that's not a big deal because we're respecting them. So the same goes for pronouns. If a woman says, oh, I'm a widower, but I still go by Mrs. so-and-so. Some might choose to go back to Miss and go back to their, to their, um, I forgot the term, um, before they were married, their, whatever their last name was. To their maiden name. Maiden name, thank you. I just, I just slipped on that. I'm looking at the little light and I'm thinking of all y'all looking at me, all y'all beautiful people. <laughs> so we don't question that. So think about how people ask to be addressed by. And think about how gender pronouns should not be something that stops you from being inclusive. So self-awareness. This is where we're gonna start asking ourselves questions. So questions asked um, to Karina and myself from chapters on bringing diversity. They often ask us, how do I talk to a person of color? And usually we get a little stumped and we just say, well, like a person or, you know, hello, how are you? My name is so-and-so. And, you know, because for us as people of color, we just think, you know, you just say, hello, how are you? My name is, and you move on. But the thing is when we present this question to other people of different ages and ethnicities and race, someone brought it to our attention that it might be that they should ask themselves, 
when was it that it became hard for them to talk to a person of color? And that's why we also have, how do I ask someone to join our chapter without them feeling like we want them just to increase our diversity? Well, we talk about building connections, building relationships, friendships. It's not about, hey, have you heard of CCL? Have you heard of this bill? Help us pass it. No, remember, we're all human. We want to be seen and we want to be heard. So think about the strength of a chapter is in its relationship, being able to move forward in community and trust. So start with friendships. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you, Karina. So while preparing the presentation, Patricia and I were talking about things that we, how we came to believe what we believe. Um, so I went back and I started looking at former picture. Um, the one right there on your left, the first one. I was a couple of months old. Um, that picture I hold dear to my heart because that is how I grew up. I am in a totally different social economic position compared to how I grew up. But along the way, I, you know, got together with family. I came to the United States. I started a career. I became known in that career when I lived in Dallas. Um, but that didn't limit me from believing certain things about different people because of things that you just would hear, right? So I, I was thinking at some point, you know, I also have my own set of biases of people. And those are so hard that even I, as a person of color, um, you know, still trying to overcome it. So I am in the state of unlearning the things that I learned. And is anything from like, and I will put my first forward so that you can understand. Um, being afraid of being around Black people. A lot of people in my family felt that way. And I usually wondered why. Like, is there something in particular that happened that I was not aware of? But I grew up with that. Um, the idea that I needed to marry someone that was white because it, I would better the family. <laughs> and, and, you know, now that I think, now that I'm older, I'm like, why was this um, accepted in the family? And why did they think that everyone should follow that? So again, I am also working on unlearning all the things that I learned. Um, and I'm just grateful to be able to be in the stage of my life where I am in a role that I serve um, to not only help people have conversations about how to have better relationships with others, but it also is helping me like look inward a bit and think about what was it that I, when was it that I started thinking about different groups of people in certain ways. Ta-da, and now I'm here after Karina. And this is where we have, of course, my share of the how I came to be and believe. And so um, unlike many, many people. I was born at a very, very early age. Um, that was the joke, sorry. Uh, this is the part in the conference where this is where everyone would laugh. <laughs> and that first picture, that is that is important to me because that's when they nicknamed me Mickey. They said I looked like a little mouse. And they said the doctor said I was born with my eyes wide open and I was very quiet, and very just attentive. And it's important to me because my parents had trouble and after four failed attempts at bringing a child into this world, they said, this was the last time. And so here I am. And so I feel that I am meant to be here and that there's something important for me to do. And I feel in my gut that that is CCL. In that other picture with my hat and my uh, sailor outfit, Yes, if you're wondering what's on the other side of the purse is a big wad of gum, you are correct. My mom flipped that last minute before the photographer took the picture. Now, the reason I have that picture there is because my mom dressed me very quickly after she came home from work and we ran over to Sears and we went to take the picture. 
And I realized that there are people that are working so hard for me to have a better life. And it gave me much respect to the immigrant story where my mom, aunts and uncles, my grandparents had to work in the fields and they had to struggle. And they did that so that I wouldn't have to, so that I could have a chance at something I wanted to do, not doing something because there was no other choice. Now that little picture of that side ponytail, very rainbow bright for those of you who were born in the eighties, that was a time that I learned that sometimes people have words that use their words to be cruel. I went up to a little girl and asked her if she wanted to play on the playground. And I thought she was so beautiful. She was a brownie and she looked all golden and her hair was blonde. And I just thought, oh my gosh, like that's what I wish I could look like. Instead I have black hair and I have brown skin, but maybe she'll play with me. See, at the time I thought brownies and Girl Scouts were only for white girls. I didn't know that, that it was for everybody because the white children were the ones that had the money the majority of the time when I was little. And she had said, we don't play with, and then she said the N word. The first thing I thought is, oh my goodness, you're not supposed to say the N word. And then I turned around thinking, oh, we have diversity. There must be a new student. I wanna welcome them. I talk a lot. I love hugs, why not? And then I realized that she was talking to me and that hurt me very much. And that was when I learned that words are very powerful and we should be mindful of how we choose to use them. And I learned a lot from that day that people are judgmental, but at the same time, I realized that it's up to us to educate our children to be respectful and to fix whatever hurt we have as adults to take that to our responsibility. Growing up, I put the picture of my high school graduation because I took two extra years to graduate high school due to learning disabilities. But I did not let it stop me and my, didn't, my mother didn't let me stop either. So I'm very proud of my high school graduation. And ableism is a real thing. So if we stop to think about being inclusive in our chapter, all we have to do is think of an accommodation, patience, empathy. What I like to say is an open mind and a flexible heart. Those are all things that we can have in our chapters. And it's very easy. It's very easy if we just stop and pause for a little bit. And that picture of me with that big old smiles at the Saguaro National Park, that was my first out of state nature trip and I funded it on my own. I was very proud of myself. And that's why I have a big old smile because I was actually able to finally check off that I went to a state park all on my own that was just a few years back. Um, I, finally, I finally was able to do it. And that was a big step for someone in my family because they would say, oh, as a woman, you shouldn't travel on your own. You need to go with a cousin or you need to go with your brother. And I said, oh no, I'm gonna do this on my own because there's no one to accompany me anyway. And I did it, so. Thanks so much, Patricia. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to do breakout. So let me thank you so much for um, taking time to have a conversation. So in this part of the program, I wanted to ask everyone to sort of share what you learned. So we opened up the chat and the question that I wanted us to think about is what did you learn from your conversation? And, and please refer this to your personal experience, not about what the person shared with you. And if you are willing, I would like to call on two volunteers to share what they personally learned so that we can all take a moment to listen. So if you could use the raise your hand tool, I will be more than happy to call on you and to listen from your experience. Ooh, I see a hand up. 
Who do we see? Stacy. All right, Stacy. Do share with us. Oh, you're on mute, Stacy. There you go. Um, I talked about how like when I was growing up, my family had the bias against basically like every other race that wasn't our own. But I necessarily adopt that because I grew up in um in the diverse like school space. Like so I was able to like interact with like people of like different colors and stuff. But I did have a bias against like 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 I like my community where it's like oh haha like cis straight white males like oh they're so ignorant and I think that's to like vocalize because this is a very like cis straight white male area and so it's like interesting to recognize that like 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 we make jokes about it but at the same time we have to recognize that like it's not true like you can't like you can't hold I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, you can't like judge other people, you know? Agreed, completely agreed. It's, it's very interesting on how we, when we start thinking about those moments we had of the things that we learned or the things that we said, it's almost like, what was it in that situation that I could have like maybe done differently? And then half the time thinking, it's just things that happen inside the family or in the situation that happen. And I'm like, but now that I'm aware, this will happen now that I am aware that this was a particular situation. Thank you so much, Stacey, for sharing. Stacey, where are you based out of? Um, Maryland. Maryland, okay. Thanks for sharing. All right, who is next? Who would like to share their experience? Justice has his hand up. Hi, Justice. You're muted. Try it one more time. You're still muted. There we go. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, for my discussion, basically, it was pretty interesting. Um, I was just going to say like an overall general thing I took away from my discussion is basically that um, a lot of times, um, you know, experiences aren't based off of just the words that were said or the actions that were taken, but sometimes you can tell just by body language or, um, you know, energies or things like that, um, you know, certain things that you just can't hide and that will also make an impact on, you know, um, how you think of a group of people or someone. Like for example, say if someone's a lady, a woman is talking and they keep and they keep getting talking over by a male, then it might um, make you think, you know, that, you know, males, um, they try to be more dominant and that they try to overtake things, you know, just from that. And the male might not even notice that they were speaking over that person. So, you know, just about how sometimes it's the, not the things that are intentional, but sometimes it's the things that um, start in the subconscious and lead to, you know, real life behavior, those also make a great impact. Um, so Justice, you were saying, you were talking about issues. Um, I know I know your mic is as, as loud as it can. I'm gonna put my headphones on one more time. And someone may be talking over another individual. Yeah, or I'll just basically things, oh, okay. Oh, you want me to further elaborate? Yeah, yeah, feel free, yes. So like basically um, things of just like, like maybe a certain social norms or um, things that people do um, not consciously um, that, you know, they stem from when they were young, maybe when they were growing up, of maybe it's how their dad treated their mom, or maybe it's how their dad treated their neighbor, you know what I mean, that was like black or something like that, or things, you know, is these examples, these smaller gestures that might even mean more than words. 
a lot of the time, you know, because words are just words at the end of the day, you know, um, it's like those. And then also when you see it every single day, repeatedly, you know, then it kind of ingrains in your mind um, certain notions of certain people and um, things of that nature. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just realized how big of an impact that actually is, you know. Um, so like even though like we already know that America has a lot, you know, even before, you know, the riots or anything like that as a very racial already had a very racial history and things like that. But a lot of the things were actually said. It was just the way that things were operated and, um, you know, and things of that nature, you know, not actually concrete things. And I feel like a part of solving that issue, um, you can't, because you could train someone what to say and what not to say or what to do and what not to do, but you can't control how someone feels or how someone um, naturally reacts to something. You know, like if someone's nervous, they'll stutter a lot or if someone is scared, they'll, and those things, you know, you don't have a lot of control over those, especially when you were raised that way. So to really target those problems, you have to actually solve the problem, not just solve what people are saying and how to be politically correct. You actually have to go deeper than that um, to you know touch that subconscious um, space in that person's brain, if that makes any sense. Oh, it does. It makes and it makes perfect sense, which is why. We, we had um, in the beginning as part of our presentation, we put that part of the presentation was gonna be called looking within. Because often when it comes to issues uh, like this, like what you were saying, like also, we don't know what it was like growing up in their household. Who knows what they saw their parents, you know, treat people. But of course, you know, when we're young, they either think we're not watching or maybe they think it's not gonna really impact the kids, you know, but yet that stuff can really get permanent in our brain and then later on become like part of our subconscious or maybe something that that we refuse to like carry or sometimes we don't even realize it till someone brings it to our attention later. So yeah, that, that stuff is very, very powerful and about being mindful about those things and how maybe it wasn't the person's fault when they were young, but as they get older, it is their responsibility to address it, to look within and figure out like, why is it that I am having these microaggressions towards this group? Or why is it that I have this attitude towards this type of person? So yeah, no, everything you said totally makes sense. And thank you so much for sharing. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much for sharing justice. Thank you, justice. Do we have a third person that would like to share? Lisa's hand is raised. Lisa. Hi. Yeah, I, um, I was telling Cheryl, I met up with Cheryl. Um, I'm only four foot 10. And so growing up, people would treat me like I was younger than they were, even if I was in their grade. And um, I have no control over my height. So I understand how other people kind of can react to um, assumptions. And uh, I feel like um, I always tried to have empathy for others when I could see that they had no control over how they looked or you know what their appearance was and you just need to get to know people better um, not based on their appearance and uh, <laughs> it was definitely something that has and still has a, a major impact on my life because people make assumptions uh, about me uh, maybe saying that I'm innocent or that I don't know any better, I don't have experience because of my height. And it's very strange. <laughs> you know, I still have a functioning brain. So <laughs> that's just something I wanted to put out there. Thank you so much for sharing, Lisa. Okay, thank you so much for Stacy and Justice and Lisa for taking a moment to share their particular experience. Yes, Cheryl, it, it's good to hear exactly that. I think sometimes we forget as we're having conversations with 
different individuals or you know in situations um how the words that we're saying impacts them and their lives so let me um bring back the slides so that we can continue on to the next portion and thank you so much for participating in this greatly activity. appreciated so this the reason why i was having that um particular time for us to look inward and look at just things that maybe we have experienced or learned is because I want us to start thinking about the CCO that we want to create, right? It usually says it takes a village to be able to create an organization that is gonna be diverse and inclusive, the one that we want to have. So here are some tips and I took these from, um, so this is this this resource called the community toolbox and the community toolbox has a whole bunch of information um, that deals a lot with community building this particular recommendation came from uh, a book it's called healing in action the authors sherry brown and george massa they pretty much list principles that when put into practice help create a favorable environment for building diverse communities and these are some of the guidelines um, you want to welcome everyone to your chapter. Um, guilt doesn't work in fostering diversity. Basically, they're saying, you know, although every person is unique, some of us have been mistreated or oppressed because we are a member of a particular group. If we ignore these present day historical differences, we may fail to understand the needs of those individuals. So we want to treat everyone, oh, this is in reference to number three, treating everyone the same may be unintentionally oppressive. We are all different. We all bring different things to the table. It's good to look at those people's diversity. People can take on tough issues more readily when the issues are presented with a spirit of hope. And I like to think that this is the CCO way. In CCO, we're always thinking, yeah, we're hopeful. This, this policy that we support is gonna make things better. Well, I like to think the more we diversify our chapters, the better we're gonna get the support that we need in order to be able to get to our final goal of a policy that we feel will help everyone in the end. Building a team around us is the most effective way of creating institutional and community change around diversity issues. At CCO, we now have diversity teams. And as I was mentioning earlier, anti-racism teams. I love to hear of chapters taking on particularly anti-racism because they realize that is 2021 and we have to make changes and yes sometimes those changes will be a little difficult but the end goal is again to build a diverse community in the chapters across CCL. Recognize and work with the diversity already present in what appears to be homogeneous groups. In working to combat racism and other forms of oppression many people become discouraged when they're unable to create a diverse group. Starting by, start by recognizing the differences in religion, sexual orientation, social economic, parenting, and class backgrounds. This will help create a climate that welcomes differences. It also helps lay the groundwork to become more inclusive. Some things that we wanted to leave you with before we finalize the session and take some questions. Um, there is particular training that normally we try to include when we do these diverse presentations. But I feel that because these presentations were done at least in the past year and a half or that we have already in community that you should go and visit them if you haven't them already. One of them being building more diverse and inclusive chapters by our very own Priscilla Talley. Um, if you saw that presentation last year, it was just fantastic on tips that she has done to build community in her own, um, in her own town of things that could possibly work for yours. Um, I usually refer people to working with environmental justice communities, uh, the page that is built by the environmental justice action team, as well as diversity in the climate movement by Clara Fang. I, usually tell people that's the first one that you should see um, before you either consider doing any form of outreach, before um, you go and engage with different communities. It's good to understand the history of what had brought us here. Why was it that CCL for so many years was predominantly white? 
What have other organizations have done? It's good to know the history before we move forward. And I just wanted to let you know that I and a, a couple of the community reps, um, we have been working on an anti-racism training page for a community. Um, that particular information right now is going to review because we do have to make sure that um, all of the CCO um, people that need to approve it, approve it. So it's going to review right now, but hopefully it will be available soon. I look forward to be able to present that at a future workshop. Um, so if we want to continue the discussion, I invite you to ask questions in the forum. Um, the diversity fellows, as well as the community rest, Patricia and myself, we go and we check the forum to see if you have any questions. I was particularly asking last week if your chapter has created either a diversity team or a diversity working group. Um, and I am asking that because I am trying to track who is doing what and what is the level of work that they're doing and want to be able to support it. If you are a Twitter fan like I am, <laughs> we created a CCL diversity page on Twitter. Please make sure to follow it. The information there ranges from uh, meeting dates of when the next diversity team will host a meeting to stories that deal with not particularly climate, but with social issues of things that we want you to be aware as a CCLer, just for your general knowledge and education. And Natalie created for us a link tree that has the list of all of the different action teams so that you can find out the times that they meet. You can link them directly to community and you can uh, get to know them. There is one team in particular that if you are white, you do not get access to, and that is the PGM caucus because that is particularly for indigenous people and people of color. Um, it is a safe space. I um, created that space because I felt that from time to time, maybe, people of my communities and different communities of color might want to get together just to discuss either a situation that we may have been going through in our respective chapter and to provide a way for us to just support each other. Um, so that is the only team you don't have access to if you're white, but if you're interested in learning about the other diversity teams, please do so. There's a Latino faction team, um, climate and culture, the Asian Pacific Action Team, the LGBTQ plus action team, and also the Listening to Indigenous Voices. That is a new team um, that was started um, last fall and is now doing programming. So they're gonna have a, a program a month to be able to just inform people about different aspects of indigenous culture and indigenous life. So Patricia. I leave it to you to close it. I laughed and I saw my little box and it was like, you're muted. And I was like, it's the story of our, it's the story of like 20, the quote of 2020, you're on mute. <laughs> so y'all, thank you so much for being with us, especially on this day of rest for some folks. And you know, nonetheless, you're putting in the work and that is amazing. So applaud yourself, high five yourself, hug yourself, give yourself that credit. Now I picked this David Suzuki quote because uh, he is an amazing scientist and also does a lot of uh, great work in communities that have been underserved or under-resourced. Uh, he's wrote like 50 books, almost 20 of them are for children. So his quote is, Change is never easy, and it often creates discord. But when people come together for the good of humanity and the earth, we can accomplish great things. And that is David Takayoshi Suzuki. And I mean, it was one of those like, what, what's, what's a, a climate talk with diversity and inclusion without a scientist? So luckily for us, we have uh, Dr. Suzuki, who is just really, really awesome. He's also an activist. He he's, has television programs, radio. He is so active. So check him out. And that's, that's the quote that I brought in. And it's all about 
um, care of care of the planet and care of all the folks and living things on it. So thank you so much, y'all. This has been great. Uh, I think we are going to have time for some questions. Yes, we are. Yes, question time. Before so, the question and answer period, though, let me put our emails up uh, there on the screen. Um, and to thank you for the opportunity of participating. If you have questions, please uh, reference them to both uh, myself and Patricia. Um, she is, uh, we are the diversity department of two people on staff, um, but we have volunteers and now fellows who are devoted, motivated, um, interested in this work. And I just cannot thank you enough for wanting to know about this and for your ability to want to work together to do this for, um, for CCL. So um, with that, we are opening up the door to open questions. So please share your question. All right, the first question we have is from Tim from New Jersey. Um, and he asks, can you expand on treating everyone the same causing issues? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question again? Can you expand on treating everyone the same causing issues? It was a bullet in your it was, PowerPoint. Okay. So here's the thing. So if we are talking to, um, now I'm thinking about it and how to put it in a, in an actual example, Patty. Okay. Oh, oh, my personal story. No, I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to answer the question on like, how do we, how does that hinder um, people working together who are treating everybody the same and not noticing the differences? Well, I, think, I, think I, mean, I, I guess I could, you guys mentioned ableism and so forth and certainly treating everyone the same if there are um, difficulties for participation or whatever, I could understand that, but just as a a general thing, it seemed to me that um, trying to have sort of balanced equal treatment of the people that I work with or, or that are say in my chapter, um, yeah. you know, giving airtime to multiple views, things of that nature, it seemed, seemed like a good thing. That's why I was interested in that point you had in your slide. So, oh, go ahead, uh, Patty, you, you finally got to something, okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was I was about to, to, to talk and I really appreciate that you expanded on that. Um, uh, well, with your question is like ableism. So if we're going to have an activity where it's all about, you know, we're going to have like a like a diversity inclusion retreat and we're going to do like a hiking thing and it's going to be all about like helping each other or but wait a minute, we forgot that we have a couple of folks who have some needs that they cannot go hiking. They do, they are of limited mobility. Does that mean we've included them? Even though it was, it was well-intentioned, yes, you know, let's, let's do something that will encourage us to be better leaders, to be better support, you know, but it, it's one of those things where you have to, to consider the others. And just like for my, I'll use my personal story. Um, I live with my parents and my mom is of limited mobility. She has osteoarthritis and fibromyalgia. And if there is not a ramp, boy, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Cause I have to go down and be the one that lifts her feet. And if someone's parking in handicapped parking, but yet, they don't have the sticker or they're not even handicapped or they just decided to grab their grandmas and put it on there. I have to run inside the store, tell the lady I need one of those little shopping carts, run out the store and then help my mom. And then, <laughs> and then somehow go park without having everyone behind me upset. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you know, we have to consider that we're individuals and we are individuals that sometimes have specific needs. What if someone is deaf and hard of hearing? Are we going to exclude them? No, we're gonna get a we're gonna get an interpreter. 
We're gonna get paper copies of the notes. You know, we're gonna take our time when speaking so that the interpreter can provide effective communication between the parties so that no one is left behind. Karina? Thank you so much for that. Yes. Any other questions? Tim also had another question. He had particular interest in how to increase his diversity for his chapter. Just quick clarification. I mean, I'm thinking about recruiting. Okay. Um, and one of the things that I spoke about in my um, breakout session was just, you know, most of the volunteers that come into our cha chapter are sort of self-recruited. They find CCL someplace. Um, I don't know that we actually have a active recruitment thing. We've started talking about it recently, but if we wanted to recruit from, you know, more diverse across all of the different things you mentioned, you know, age, political affiliation, race, um, you know, ways to do that is I guess one of my interests. Definitely from Teller's presentation on increasing chapter diversity is a good one. Um, I can tell you things that I have done because I also, I am a member of a predominantly white chapter. Um, so, but I was, you know, at the time that I was extremely active inside my chapter, now not as much because of the role that I am now um, doing for CCL. Um, I would go into, but uh, again, this is prior to COVID. <laughs> So I'm going to tell you before COVID and after COVID. Um, so prior to COVID, I will go into health fairs. No one ever thinks about going to a health fair to talk about climate because they're related. Those issues are interconnected. Um, I will go into health fairs. I will go into community fairs to talk about CCL. Um, I joined the Chamber of Commerce because I was trying to get to know members. So I, I first went in just to be able to know the members in my community because I had just moved into my town. Um, but I, I did go into the Chamber of Commerce and became a member just to go learn about them. And I also went and joined a community group in my neighborhood. I live in a predominantly African-American neighborhood. Uh, but I came to learn that there was a particular situation in my neighborhood and people were gathering to find out and support. Uh, a particular effort. And I went and I joined that effort, again, just to go and join to learn about the effort, not to talk about CCL in any way, not to talk about my role in CCL in any way. Uh, but come to find that my activity gave me two things. One, within a year of participating in one Chamber of Commerce event, uh, one uh, lady that I have come to know, she finally said, Karina, I know that you work in climate work, but you never told me about it. Can you tell me about it? And then I told her about it. And then she said, could you come and present to my group? I went and presented in her group. And then she said, what activity can we do to help you? And I'm like, could you please go and sign this endorsement? And she uh, put her organization forward and she was the first Latina organization in Florida to support the Energy Innovation Act. But that took time. So it wasn't something that took two or three times or something in an effort, it was establishing a relationship of a year to get to know her. In the second opportunity, um, I have, since I've been volunteering in support of my community center, where I get to meet a lot of people, another lady stepped forward in the last couple of weeks. And she said, Karina, I noticed in your signature line, because we were changing emails about something that we wanted to do with a community center, Again, this is after COVID now. Um, we have been keeping in touch through email. Um, she said, I didn't know that you were doing climate work. And did you know that we have this local climate thing that we're trying to do and you should get involved, like you should come and join us. And then she said, I really do wanna know about what you're doing. So we had a meeting. She wants to learn more about PCL and hopefully volunteer. So we're in that stage right now. Um, but again, I didn't go in there wanting to say, hey, I am gonna tell you about the Energy Innovation Act and why it's good for you. That is not how I do relationship building. My relationship building is I am just a person that I'm going to these different places to get to know what they're doing and supporting their work. And that is what I'm asking other CCLers to do. Thank you. Right. You're welcome. 
Patty, you want to um, share a bit, provide any suggestions on how to help diversify the chapter? Um, much of it is, is like yours. It's about establishing relationships because, uh, and I'll use an example. Uh, I used to work with the deaf and hard of hearing community. And also uh, it's also referred to as the signing community because of American Sign Language or sign language. Um, I was very lucky to have had deaf and hard of hearing friends so that when I went to events where there were deaf and hard of hearing folks, they were like, oh, she's with them, okay. So I was very lucky in that sense that there were that I was with people. So I had been vouched for. Because one of the first things is when, and I will use the term as the deaf and hard of hearing have, hearing person, they have said, you know, what do you want, hearing person? What what are you doing here? And one of the first things, are you here to change me? Are you here to tell me that I need a cochlear implant or a hearing aid? Are you here to tell me that I have to learn how to use my voice even though I'll have a deaf accent and people will make fun of me? So sometimes there are groups have, that have just been hurt so much that one of the things is there is like, what are you trying to push? So instead of, of, of just coming into a community and just thinking about the bill, just go in and just say hello if it's and I know it's so tricky with COVID now right but like back then you could be like go to a potluck or just have a getting to know you or just having something that's very neutral start a book club and ask folks if they want to read this book that talks about climate issues but a lot of of what Karina said is what I what I'm I agree with it's about building and establishing relationships it's kind of like thinking of a garden, you're focusing on the soil, having fertile soil, you want diversity because that's what helps the flowers bloom, it brings all sorts of other insects. So when you bring in all the different plants and flowers or vegetable gardens, everything is in abundance. So just think of nurturing your chapter right now as is nurturing the soil before you start to bring in outside diversity so that you guys are set and you are solid. And they could see that and they could be like, wow, I wanna be a part of this chapter they're super cool. They're legit. They're awesome. They're good to each other. I want to be in a group that's going to be good to me. So that's something that I could that I could think of right now. This is really great sort of ideas and perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Any other questions? Thank you, Tim. Yeah, the next question is from Justice and he asks, do you have to go through your chapter to establish an official CCL focus group on diversity for your chapter? Hmm, that's a very interesting proposal. <laughs> this is why I love things like this. I'm I was like, about to say, Karina, have you ever had that question before? I, and I'm like, expand on your idea, Justice, because I think I think there's an idea coming in here. Expand a little but, bit more. No, nah, honestly, I'm just new to CCL, so I just really wanted to know, like, do I have to get there okay, basically, to start a diversity focus group? Um, or is it like, you know, to become a, because I don't know if there's like a list of all the groups for all the chapters or anything, or if it's just you basically how you present it to your chapter, basically, right? Am I right? So basically, you go and present it over to your chapter, your chapter leader or leaders, and you okay. basically say, "Hey, I want to take on this diversity work thing," and you can invite as many people. So I've heard of people um, starting. What was it that they were doing before? It's like there are different chapters throughout CCL at different levels. So there's some of them that I were like, they started a diversity team and they started doing book readings. And then at some point they did movies. And now because of COVID, of course, a lot of the work stopped because there were a couple of groups that were doing like um, listening tours where they were visiting different community places around a state to go learn about those different communities just for the sake of learning about them. So it's all dependent on how you want to design things. Um, what I'm asking people is that when they do that, to notify, um, you know, after you get the approval of your chapter leader, of course, um, to notify um, Patricia and I so that we can at least know. And the idea is, this is our wish list, our idea is to get a meeting together of all of these different diversity teams and groups so that we can come and share ideas. Because I think at this point, 
someone must have tried something that has worked and there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. If we already have something that might have worked in doing outreach, in communicating with a group, or even learning about different groups, trying to build relationships with different kinds of community. It's good for us to be able to do that together. So thank you so much for your interest. And thank you, yeah, that helped a lot. Thank you. And I'll definitely um, let you keep you guys updated. Thank you. Yay! Yeah, I'm one of those. I say, yay! I'm like, I'm like that mom in the kindergarten graduation class. Yay! Like, I can't, I can't help it. That made me excited. I was like, yay! <laughs> Thank you so much. Any other questions? We're at three thirty-five, so we're a little early. The session is supposed to go until four, uh, but I wanted to give it time for for us to have uh, discussions and to be able to answer some questions. Especially because, um, you know, this is not uh, this is not just the the easy like, hey, you want to come over here and talk about diversity and anti racism? It's pretty, you know, of coffee, just a little something. No, this is something that is in depth and takes time, and it takes healing, and it takes searching and self evaluation, and so that, that's why we wanted to make sure that there was time. So that if someone had questions, if there was someone that needed extra time, because you, uh, uh, y'all's, see, I told you I'm so Texan, y'all's uh, comfort and, and intellectual curiosity is like what we want to make sure that you feel safe, comfortable. If there's questions, we're here to answer them, you know, um, just like with justice bringing up like, hey, well, how would I do that in my chapter? Like, great question. And maybe there's someone else in the group that has the same one. We just wanted to make sure that y'all y'all felt like this is, this is your time. Like, yeah, we're gonna give some presentation, but this is one of those topics where this is where we discuss. And so, you know, this is, we wanted to make sure there was ample time for that. So by all means, if there's questions, you know, Tim raised his hand. Ooh. Tim, Tim's back. Sorry, I, I, I talk a lot. I'm, no, that's I'm, fine. I do too. Um, I actually, I had two things. Um, the, the, the easier one first. Um, so probably like many of the chapters, um, ours leans white and liberal. And I think it would be very challenging for particularly a conservative to be part of our chapter and not feel a bit picked on. I mean, we, we've not been ethnically, I mean, we're gender diverse, um, we're age diverse, I think, but we're not um, politically diverse um, and we're not really all that racially diverse. Um, but I, I think it's a very liberal leaning and you know, a lot of people like me have been enjoying, you know, who got elected and inauguration and things. And it's it's really, you know, how do you keep that out? Or how much do you let of that in? And as a as a member, as opposed to a leader, how do you say, you know, how, you know, you know what that 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 leans a little too far one way or the other. Maybe you could keep that to yourself or um, you know, we're trying to be and, and this to me is one of the most important things about CCL is it isn't going to work unless it's bipartisan. It isn't going to work unless we bring a lot of people together. Um, and, you know, even I was mentioning it earlier, um, Danny Richter talking about getting all the people who sponsored it before. There were 60 Democrats and one Republican. That's not bipartisan. That's, you know, our Congresswoman laughs at us when we say it's bipartisan. So, but how do you make it a safe place for other opinions and other ideas and other, other political points of view? That, that takes uh, an individual person's awareness to be able to make that happen. Um, my chapter has been growing slowly as far as like getting conservatives um, to come on board. So it's like, I think at some point I, when I was also like doing stuff, I'm also trying, I'll do my own internal check-in on like, cause sometimes, you know, 
people in discussion say things <laughs> and it can be maybe offensive to our conservative friend <laughs> if we don't watch it but you're thinking of recruiting and as far as like recruiting um conservatives and people of color and i have been suggesting that we go to the local colleges and universities when clara fang does her outreach a lot of both uh both communities are coming from the colleges and universities um when you think about it the young folks are the ones that are are just you know finding that it's an urgency to be able to work on climate work right now right so they recognize the urgency and you can find all forms and perspectives in colleges and universities so engage the republican club at that college and university try to get someone in from there to allow them to give you that you can give a presentation and talk about what we're trying to do over at cco um i'm, I'm using the same thing that i would use similar to to try to engage uh groups of color right because we all have that need it's, it's the same thing it's a group that we don't have represented right now in the chapter, but we hope that in the future we will. Um, so yeah, that can be that. I'm like, I'm trying, like, I wish I had someone from the conservative caucus in this room. I'm going to work on that next time we have a diversity talk. I will get a conservative person in this room so that they can help us to give tips. Um, and I've been working a lot on the on the people of color uh, BIPOC um, outreach. So. But those are some suggestions that I can give you right now that I can I think guess of. I was thinking, I mean, those are all good ideas about recruiting. I just managing inside the chapter, the way that people are speaking, you know, not necessarily my place to try to tell anybody they're saying something, um, you know, too extreme. Um, but sometimes I do, but it just, is there good ways to remind people that we're a bipartisan group and? My, my chapter leaders will do that from time to time when we're hearing something, yeah. we'll, you know, we'll remind someone to like, you know, wanted to make sure that everybody understood that we're bipartisan and that we walk on the different perspectives. I know it can be really hard. <laughs> I know. Um, but I think that is up to the chapter leader. And, and, and when you see situations, um, sometimes you can have a side conversation with a volunteer to basically, you know, just to try to get something going of like, you know, we really want to emphasize that CCL is bipartisan. And, uh, you know, although I understand you said X, Y, and Z, you know, maybe because of the conversation, whatever, whatever, you know, you can try to find a way to be able to um, You bring attention to someone in 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 a meeting who could have you know maybe not had a good experience because of something that they heard inside of them i see erica's hand up yeah hi um i just wanted to weigh in tim um, on tim's question as a chapter leader myself i can see what, what you're saying we definitely have that from time to time in my chapter and i do think Karina's on to something there by sort of framing it at the beginning of a meeting. We'll often revisit one or two or more of a, sorry, my cat's hungry. It's trying to tell me to feed it. Um, <laughs> to, uh, to revisit CCL's values and maybe like have one person volunteer to, to go over the values or even just to, to focus on that one value about nonpartisanship particularly if you can, you know, say at your February meeting with all of these executive orders coming out, people might want to be crowing about all the wonderful things Biden is doing. And it might be good to frame like how, how do these executive orders, how will these be a, a, a challenge or a boon for nonpartisanship or something like that? Like it might be a way to forestall some of the more uh, difficult points for conservative members. Um, but I also wanted to uh, say in particular to Patricia, I wanted to thank you for bringing up ableism and deafness and other differences um, as part of diversity. I admit that's not something I thought about as much um, until you mentioned it. And um, I'll do more thinking about that. It's really valuable. So thank you for bringing that into the conversation. 
Thank you, Erica. Um, I greatly appreciate it. And, um, you know, it's, it's in my heart and it's also, it's also my job to be here for y'all and to find out as many different ways to make it as smooth as possible so that y'all can just have fun being CCL volunteers. You know, and I was gonna say, Tim, you know, we, we also get that question from other folks too. Like, how do we, how do we make sure that maybe, you know, a little, the, let's say like for you, you were talking about the more conservative group, you know, that there's, that people feel okay, that they feel safe so that people stay. You know, you can also encourage them, like, you know, if, if you all want to use the Zoom line, you know, outside of our meeting times to chit chat since we can't get together for COVID, maybe that could be a possibility. Or, hey, if you all, we need to move on because we have to get to this agenda and remember our core values of bipartisanship. If you all want to exchange numbers and continue this conversation, you know, by all means, but right now we're on our CCL time. And like Karina said earlier, community agreements are very helpful because it's just, you know, sometimes we just need reminders because we get so caught up in the everyday busyness. So, and also like what Erica said, just reminding folks like, hey, don't forget about a core values, you know, little things like that that make big, big differences. So even though they seem really tiny or really tedious, Sometimes that can be the stuff that helps you the most. So I just wanted to put that out there too. Thanks everybody for the ideas. Okay, and then I finally did a patty. <laughs> I was unmuted. <laughs> I was muted and I'm like, okay, time to speak. Um, we have Max has his hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Okay, Next. cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, I really appreciated the distinction made between um, uh, diversity and anti-racism. I, I, I hadn't thought of it that way. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, and on the flip side, I think that um, as a chapter leader, anti-racism is a um, uh, meaningful tool to combat um, or to make a place more inclusive. You know, I, I feel like there have been many times where I've been in CCL environments where people have said things that have been um, uh, innocently racist or like naively racist, um, probably myself included. And, um, and so, you know, having people go through the training to um, make a space more accommodating by not, um, by, by not, by by knowing the the parameters of of not further further marginalizing and already a group that's already sensitive to a, a dynamic, and so I'm I'm curious you know if if you have suggest I mean it's just it seems so unsurmountable like how do, how do you make people attuned to a dynamic like that and and if you have any suggestions on how to help move a chapter forward in being um, sensitive to race issues. Or diversity issues. That is a million dollar question. <laughs> I um, thank you, thank you for your question. It's um, oh, where do I start? Okay, so I'm gonna put it from myself as a person of color talking about anti-racism. It's extremely painful. Um, I'm a Latina. When I talk about racist situations, I usually think. I don't experience the racism, the level that my African-American friends experience racism. So I, that's already in my mind perspective. Um, so when I am tackling this work, as I'm making suggestions, I'm thinking, all I'm asking is just for people to remember, you know what, the work is basically this, trying to help humans or other humans just talk and listen to each other. So that can be very hard to do. Like in, in the work that we're trying to do as volunteers, like, you know, we, there's this bill that we support, we're trying to get all of these things, like in order to get this done. And at the same time, we can completely bypass that there is things that are happening to different communities outside of us. Not, well, yeah, they're also inside this organization um, that we should be aware of. Like, you know, George Floyd 
George Floyd opened up a lot of conversations that maybe a lot of us have not had. It was a very unfortunate incident that should have never had happened. And George Floyd was not the first one, right? So as African-American, we need to continue to have these experiences happening in their community that is just never endless. So it can be very draining. It can be something that I'm like, I don't want to go and talk about diversity and anti-racism right now because you know what? I have to go worry about what's happening over in my community center. So I, I can offer that perspective. So I, I'm trying to make sure that I try to answer the question the best way that I can. Um, it's a matter of just being more self-aware. Like yeah. I know that we can do this. Self-awareness is a very hard thing to do sometimes, right? Um, I, I can only speak from you know, my experience of how, having been the only person of color sometimes in a predominantly white room and having the need to think about how I dress, how I speak, how I communicate with other people so that I can be taken seriously. I don't want anyone to experience that in any session. I don't. Ideally, it should be someone comes in. Hi, how are you? How's it going? You're doing great. Wonderful. Here's some things that we can do together. It's like we're aware that we need to work together in order to move this forward. Can we just not start thinking about all of these things that are just going to make just the situations that we don't want to happen inside our chapters? Um, that's what I'm thinking right now. I'm sure something will come. Uh, Patty? Max, you have a really good question. And one part is, is that, you know, folks have asked that and they bring it up. That's why Karina said million dollar question, because that one comes up a lot. But the thing is, is that we can't make people not be racist. They have to choose. Like, you know what? I'm being racist. I need to figure out where this came from. I need to figure out how I'm going to go about this. So a lot of it is self-awareness. Like I'm gonna share some stuff about me because I like like Karina said, I can only speak, we can only speak from our our ourselves. Like I live along the Tex Mex border. I have a border wall the south of me. I have three internal checkpoints the north of me that will ask me if I'm an American citizen. And then sometimes, depending on the mood of the agent, they might say, show me identification. Now, it's up to you how you want to challenge it. But as a brown woman, I'd rather just say, here's my driver's license. Here's my passport. Here's my social. Would you like my birth certificate? I'll give it to you all. Just let me go. Please. It's too much to bear. And then we have fracked gas companies coming in along our Gulf coastline so we have environmental racism we have systemic racism that's going out through all all of the community um even to get to one of the beaches there's a checkpoint because it's where the rio grande and the gulf of mexico meet and you really could hop over to mexico because it's just it it dwindles it's so small you know how rivers you know change but no matter what no one deserves to be militarized so i come with a lot of a lot of stuff. So sometimes when I come into a room, I may look really tired. And people might see that as like, what's her deal? I'm trying to be nice to her. No, it's just I got a lot of PTSD and trauma. <laughs> but I'm here because I believe in the cause. So sometimes it's part of that empathy. It's part of that, you know what, don't know where this person's coming from. Who knows what happened five minutes ago, five days ago, five hours ago. So it's one of those things where, to me, we can't make people not be racist, but at least we can lead by example by using empathy, love, and kindness. And hopefully that will, that will, that, I like to say I'm not an activist, but an impactivist. Like I hope that like how I live and how I lead every day will make a positive impact on the people around me, even the animals around me. You know, I hope that they can feel my energy and feel happy and loved. So that's kind of like the best way at this point in my life that I that I can think of how to deal with racism around me. And I have plenty of stories, but I just do my best to lead healthy, 
and positive. I don't know if any of that helps. It does? Okay, thank goodness. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, that, 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 those are great perspectives. Thank, thanks for sharing. And, um, you know, it, it makes me realize that, you know, what I, I guess what I'm going for is not necessarily anti-racism training, but more so along the cultural competency lines and, you know, just being tuned into I'm, my goal. And I, I definitely welcome feedback on this is to, is to create a space where people don't have their marginalized identity centered for them by somebody else but also a space where we don't ignore or overlook those identities. You know, we can embrace the different backgrounds. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, yes, cultural competency is, is going to be, I'm going to give you more of that, Patricia and I going to give you more of that this year. Because <laughs> uh, I finally have someone to, to help me. I have so many ideas of things I wanted to do, but um, not enough help. But, you know, now, now I do. So, Here's something, just a cultural thing. Like if we were in a room uh, in person, it is natural for me to go up to the person that even if I don't know them, to go up to them and hug them and possibly give them a kiss on the cheek. It is a cultural thing. We do this all the time. So the TCLers that know me prior to COVID, when we had a conference, they knew to come up to me and give me a hug. It's acceptable in this area. I welcome that. That is something that I do in my community every single time. That might not be the same for someone who has not grown up thinking that that is a, a good greeting, right? Or a, a great greeting. But for me, that's definitely acceptable. I tell people it's okay. I, I love touch, the feel like I am interacting with another human right now. This is great. It's also very possible that if I find someone that speaks Spanish, that I'm going to go speak to them in Spanish. We're not talking about every white person around us. Please take that idea out of your mind. That is not the reason. It is just because sometimes when we are in different settings, especially in this particular setting, where sometimes we don't see a lot of people like us, that when we find another Latino that speaks Spanish or like we can communicate, we see each other and are like, oh my God, like I can talk to you in my language and I can be just absolutely awesome today. It is great to be able to do that without thinking that other people are gonna be offended or thinking, oh my God, are they talking about you? I'm like, no, I'm not gonna talk about you. It's not me, because I'm extremely honest. If I have something to tell you, I'll tell you. And in two languages, because I'm bilingual. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> but you know, that can be, that can be something that I wanna be able to integrate a little bit more of just things that, that we do in different cultures so that everybody can be aware, which is why I am loving what is taking place in the listening to indigenous voices right now because that team is already thinking of, there's education that needs to take place inside the organization. Um, they have at least a six month program set up where we can go and learn about, for example, land acknowledgement. Why do people do land acknowledgement? Is it culturally appropriate? Is it correct? Um, so, you know, we're thinking about things that we need to learn as CCLers as we continue to open up the doors to bring diverse voices and diverse communities to the organization. So thank you so much for, for knowing that and for reminding me that I need to go <laughs> do more programs on that. Patty, you, you wanna chip in? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for picking up on that. And even see, even in this, this tiny moment, you started you know, with one thing and you went, wait a minute, I think I'm actually more going towards cultural competency. So give me a second. And you were kind of going towards that which helps us realize like, you know what, when people feel like this, it might be a little bit more this way. And that helps us develop more on content so that the content is rich and full of, of beneficial information. And like Karina says, you know, before she was a, a one, one woman team, you know, and now I'm here. And uh, I, February 4th will mark my one month but <laughs> I'm hopping to it as much as possible. And one of my promises to CCL uh, volunteers has been one of my things is I wanna make sure that uh, the BIPOC, BIPOC community feels safe and that they can speak their piece, they can share their concerns, that people aren't gonna over talk them anymore or ignore them anymore. I've actually seen that in spaces 
And I've had to go in and say like, hi, just so you know, I'm the diversity inclusion program coordinator. I think we need to be a little more mindful about when people share. I saw this happen and I just, I feel like it'd be best if we remember that we need to give equal opportunity. We don't want anyone to feel left out, especially when it could look like racism or maybe it is racism. So it's one of those things where sometimes people are unaware in the front of their minds, but in the back, they're still going on like an old way. But anyhow, thank you so much for that. It, it helps us know a little bit more of uh, the content we need to provide for y'all. And with that, it is four o'clock. So I wanted to thank you for taking time out of your Sunday afternoon to spend time with us, to have discussions about this, uh, sending hugs from afar, um, sending you good vibes and good blessing. And thank you so much for joining us.